Splendid. Splendid. That's much better, dear. You ought to spend a little more time on that passage. So I can't practice any more today, Mom. Got to go to the doctor's place. What do you want done today, sir? Well, let me see. I think the head needs clipping. Well, I did that day before yesterday. Well, we might give it a polish. You know, uh, spigato with no stops? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's have a look at that forehead. It's coming along all right. Guess I'll have to make a rule. No more walking on picket fences. Yeah, or else buy him a football helmet. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly work hard thinking up things for him to do. Happy birthday, Mary. Thank you. Oh, you angel. More Pirelli records. Oh. Well, he seems to be your pet conductor. He's the best in the world, I think. Let's play them, shall we? Sure. Yeah, but I flew it. I don't care. I ask you to. You do what I say or I'll never fix your old plane again. Now, see here, young man. I've had enough of this. Yes, sir. That's the fourth window that's been broken this summer, and it's got to stop. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Well, what's all the shooting for this time? I just broke a window with this. Yes, and this time he's got to pay for it. I thought you were clipping the hedge. Well, I was, but I stopped for just a minute. I just wonder if you weren't taking in a little too much territory. Huh? Now, if you put the rudder a little more to the left, wouldn't it fly in a tighter circle and land right back on the field? Gee, that's right. I don't like to interrupt your scientific observations, Doctor, but who's going to pay for the window? Oh, yes, yeah. That's right. Let me see, uh, one pane of glass. That's about uh, five cents, isn't it? Twenty cents? As much as that? Well, well, of course, we'll have to... We'll have to take it out of Billy's wages at the rate of about uh, five cents a week. Oh, by the way, it's payday, isn't it? Yes, sir. Well... Oh. I've only got a quarter. But I can't make change. Uh, we'll start the deductions next week. I can make the change, Doctor. Here's a couple of dimes. You don't get a nickel if I had my way. Well, I guess you'll remember by that left rudder the next time. I sure will. Mr. 
Mrs. Stanley? Well, Johnny, um, I got all the notes right, didn't I? Letter perfect. But there's a great deal more to music than just striking the right notes. Why are you always in such a hurry? Well, I got to play football. Johnny, why do you go on taking music lessons? Because my pop says I got to be an orchestra leader like Kay Kaiser. He says they make good money. Better than a truck driver, even. But you'd much rather be a truck driver, wouldn't you? Honestly. Sure. Who wouldn't? One of them big diesels. Then I wish you'd tell your father that I can't go on taking his money. Because you'll never make a violinist, much less an orchestra leader. Do you mean that, Mrs. Stanley? I regret to say I do. Gee, super! <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Five cents shy today. Meaning one soda? No, plus the window. Mrs. Hastings made him doubt me that much a week. Well, I don't suppose that'll break it. Though every nickel counts just now. I know. Say, Mom, why can't I get a job in a dance orchestra someplace? Why well, I might earn as much as 15 bucks a week. We're aiming much higher than that, darling. Billy, dear. I believe you can become a really fine concert artist. Me? A concert artist? Yes. But first I have to get you to Chicago or Cleveland or New York for an audition. And that takes money. New York? Just wait till I tell Nancy. I'll bet she'll mind me now. <laughs> I doubt it. But it means hard work this summer, Billy. At least eight hours practice a day. Yeah. I suppose so. Life can sure be tough, can it, Mom? You bet it can. Splendid, too. With something like this to live for. That was Mrs. Mitchell. Clarence has got another sore throat. Really? She said you must fix him up so we can go to Mrs. Higby's musical this afternoon. Is that today? For Sunday in the month. And you needn't look like that. You can't get out of going. Uh, why do I have to listen to her pupils? Because you brought them all into the world, and their fathers and mothers expect it. I'm yeah, supposed to do. And you've got to see Mrs. Bailey. She yeah. says her feet are bad again. Sometimes I wish I'd taken up plumbing. Don't know as you'd have any more fun mending bathrooms. Here. Better take these along. Looks like rain. I didn't know what to do, doctor, so I rubbed his throat with goose grease and bound it up with flannel. That's a good old-fashioned remedy. Oh. Good morning, Clowns. Good morning, doctor. Oh, Mother, I'm not that sick. Mother's worried about her darling boy. He's been having these attacks regularly, doctor, about once a week. Oh, he has? Uh, when did he begin to feel bad? About an hour ago. I see. Uh, you might get me a glass of water, Mrs. Mitchell. Yes, Doctor. Open your mouth. Say, ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Mm-hmm. Clowns, which do you think is worse? My medicine or Sunday school? Your medicine. Hurry, Mother, quick. Mother, hurry. I do hope you'll be all right for the music hour this afternoon. Wouldn't surprise me if you felt fine by that time. Goodbye, Clowns. Clarence seems awfully delicate. Well, maybe he's too clean. Too clean? Oh, boy, his age. Doctor, you're not serious. There's nothing wrong with Clarence that a little dirt wouldn't cure. 
But I'm a pair of all walls tomorrow. And send him off with the rest of the kids to play in the mud. Oh, yeah. sure. He comes home too clean, put him to bed without any supper. And if that doesn't work, I'll send you all a great big bottle of that medicine. Well, of all the ridiculous prescriptions. We'll have a bed just like that. Just like Marie Antoinette. No, that's too fancy. It is not. I won't have a thing like that in my room. Look here, Billy Stanley. You've got to let the woman furnish the house or our engagement is off. Well, I guess if the man earns the money, he ought to have some say. He ought not. Well, I heard Dr. Christian say the man ought to wear the pants in the family. Yeah, well, Dr. Christian is old-fashioned. we got equal rights for women. Haven't you ever heard of the Nineteenth Amendment? Oh, give me the funnies. I want to see how Dick Tracy gets out of that concrete mixer. Nancy, Nancy, darling. Yes, Mother. Oh, hello, Billy. Oh, Nancy, darling, Mother wants you to get the music out of the secretary and be sure to keep it in the right order. Say, Mom, why don't you ever let Billy play any of these Sunday things of yours? Well, it isn't that, uh, well, it's just that you're such a very little girl, you wouldn't understand. Mr. Clarence is going to play this on his sax. I bet that'll be good. <laughs> well, <laughs> they even got Clarence in the funny papers. Give me that. Oh, I'm so glad that you could come this afternoon. We want to miss you for anything. It's just lovely. Thank you. And you, my dears, I'm so happy to see you. And darling Clarence, how does your throat feel? Oh, it's all right now. <laughs> my dear Mrs. Higby, what do you think Dr. Christian prescribed for Clarence's sore throat? Dirt. And oh, hello, Dr. Christian. I'm so happy uh -oh. to see you here. And my dear Mrs. Stanley, I'm afraid you may not consider my little concert up to your critical standards. But in the matter of music, we hope that quantity will make up for quality. I'm sure it will. I am so glad to see you all here this afternoon. And I am so happy to think that perhaps these monthly recitals add at least a little to the cultural tone of our city. And now, we will open the program this afternoon with a violin solo by my newest pupil. And one whom I am sure you will agree with me shows great promise, Johnny Bates. I thought Johnny was one of your pupils. He was. Why did he leave you? I advised him to give up music. Pardon me for saying so. We now come to the pierce the resistance of our little soiree. A saxophone solo by darling little Clarence Mitchell. Thank you. 
a little unfortunate circumstance has arisen, but we shall continue. We'll just skip that part, darling, and pick it up from the top of the next page. Fifteen two four and a pair of six. My crib. Somebody in trouble? Sounds like it. You'll need more field than that. Better call Dr. Christian. Where? The landing field. All right, I'll call him right away. Landing field? I'll go right out. This is Dr. Christian. How do you do? The patient's a very important man. Are you competent? Well, I've had considerable experience. Good. I must get the maestro to Chicago as quickly as possible. There's an important contract. The maestro? The great Antoine Pirelli, sir. Antoine Pirelli? Well, well, we can't have anything happen to him. He's your favorite conductor here, boss. I don't think I'm badly hurt, doctor. Just shaken up a bit. Answer, Doctor. I'm all right, Mickey. Uh, arrange for accommodations on the next train. I'm afraid you'll have to postpone the trip. What's on your mind, Doctor? Well, I don't think there's anything serious, but I'd like to keep him under observation for a day or so. Possible. We must get on to Chicago. I'm quite well enough to travel. Oh. Well, you better sit down. Oh. Hey. But, Maestro, the Doctor is right. You are hurt. Quite badly, I think. Think of the headlines I shall get in every paper in the country. Worth thousands to us. Flying maestro crashes. Uh, is there a decent hotel, Doctor? We think so. Good. We'll take the largest suite. There'll be flowers all over the place and nurses. And the newsreel cameramen will come and find the maestro with a beautiful bandage on his head. There'll be at least one nurse. River Send 7-9. And, Doctor, about that nurse, please. One who photographs well. No old battle axes. I think you'll find it quite satisfactory. Hello, Mary. Give me a hand, will you? Sure. But, Doctor, isn't Judy available? Well, uh, Judy is still on her vacation, and uh, Stella Carson only leaves in the daytime. Mm-hmm. You'd better come right to the hotel. Goodbye. <sighs> this will make you sleep. Thank you, Doctor. And when you wake up, I think you're going to feel very much better. Hello, Gladys. This is Mickey. I'm speaking from a little bird called River's End. I'm sorry to say we've had a slight accident. No, not bad, but there's a horse and buggy doctor here who sent Antoine to bed for a couple of days. Well, if Antoine is hurt, I'm coming at once. Oh, it's nothing serious. But I just called to warn you not to believe anything you read in the papers. It's just a little ballyhoo. And tell your father and the broadcasting people that we'll be a couple of days late for rehearsal. Hello, Mary. Hello. I hope you're feeling quite fit. Of course. What is it, Doctor? It's like concussion. He's sleeping under a sedative now.
know you meant it kindly, but I can't take this case, Doctor. Why not? Don't you see it? It's Billy. John must have a thousand other interests by this time. I don't know how he feels about me now. You can't, Mary, unless you try to find out. But he'd find out about Billy. That's one secret I couldn't keep. And, and then he could take him away. No court would do that after all these years. I know, but Billy's musical career, John could sponsor it. He's got the power and the money to do it. I couldn't stop him once he'd found out. And then I might lose my son. Listen, Mary, I can't let you throw this chance away for your sake or for Billy's. You did a foolish thing once in Paris. Perhaps now you could right that wrong. I can't risk it. I can't. Aren't you thinking only of yourself? I'll find some other way to get Billy started. Some way that will let me keep him. Perhaps you can. But a man like Pirelli has a right to know his own son. Think how much it would mean to be ready to give the world a son with such talent. And think how much faster and further Billy could go with his father behind him. You can't consider only yourself now. You know you can't. But don't you see? Billy means so much to me. He's all I have. You kept the sacred well about John Pearson, Antoine Pirelli. Even from Billy and from me. You can keep the secret about Billy from his father until you're sure that it's safe for you to tell. And if he still loves you, think what you might be throwing away. get up, put on a Sunday suit, and come with his violin. Morning, nurse. I must have fallen asleep. I beg your pardon. I'm the one that's been asleep. When did you come in? I've been here all night. I must speak to that doctor. His sedatives are much too effective. Would you open that blind little for me, please? just as beautiful as ever. And you haven't changed a bit. Ironical, isn't it? Looking back now. We were so young. I was so... Impulsive. Well, you did divorce me by... How have you been getting on, Mary? As well as could be expected. I have my work. I find a certain amount of happiness in it. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Doctor. I brought Miss Carson to relieve Mary. And by the look of things, it's about time. The patient looks better than the nurse this morning. Then we have the nurse to thank for it. You'd better go home and get some rest, Mary. Am I well enough to have visitors today? I think so. Might even take that bandage out today. Uh, Dr. Christian, I'm not very familiar with the ethics of medicine, but isn't it in the code to prevent a nurse who is off duty from returning to the sick room as a visitor? Well, in certain cases, I was going You will come back soon? Yes, John. Tell him? No, not yet. Why, it's about time. Golden, don't you think so? 
Uh, Mr. Delancer, we'll just a moment, Mrs. Higby. Thank you. Come along, children. Get out your instruments. Hurry along. Hurry along. I'd like to see Mr. Pirelli, please. Sorry, I can't disturb Mr. Pirelli. Why, Miss Martin! Mrs. Higby! You came all the way from Cesar City. Why not? I have just as much right. I think not. After all, Mr. Pirelli fell in River's End. These are the little musical ass, eh? Are you Miss Stacy? Yes, I have the honor to serve the maestro as business manager. Then you can arrange an audition. Yes, an audition? I have several pupils of fictional promise. So have I. Well, ladies, ladies, I'm sure your little charge is talented, but unfortunately, the maestro has had to make a rule. He cannot give audition. Oh, but surely just this one. Yes, just this one. I'm sorry, ladies. The rule is never broken. Good day. No. We'll just have to go back home again, children. Yes, I suppose there's nothing else to do. Come on. No, no, Johnny. No, no. But I thought you said we were going home. We are not going home. Follow me, children. How are you to push your way in the end? If he's agreed to give Billy an audition, I shall most certainly see that he hears my pupils, too. There's been no mission of an audition, and I'm the next. I always said I should take up nursing. Now, children, this is a little piece that we all rehearsed together. Now, you may not know all of the notes so well, but we'll do the best we can. One, two, three, begin. <laughs> For pity's sake, what's that? Sounds to me like Mrs. Higby. Who? Our local musical impresario. I understand, Doctor. That is what the Hepcats call a clam bake. <laughs> I'll try to stop it. <laughs> no violence, Doctor. Just give them one of your sleeping pills. Is he listening? Yes, intently. Does he want us to go inside? No, I couldn't allow it. You see, Mr. Pirelli has been quite ill. I want him to rest. But it would only take a minute. I'm sorry, Mrs. Higby, but I must insist. Unless you leave at once, I cannot answer for the consequences. All right, children. I guess we will go home. Well, you can at least tell your parents that you've been hurt by the great Anton Pirelli. Of course! Come along, children. Come along. Gee, Mom, what's going on around here this morning? Why, dear? Oh, you look sort of all shined up. <sighs> this may be a great day for us, Billy, darling. Yeah? How? I'm going to take you to the hotel with me. And maybe. I'm not quite certain. Antoine Pirelli will hear you play. Oh, well, I thought we'd get a trip to Chicago or New York for an audition. But this is Antoine Pirelli. You should be thrilled. Sure. I'm thrilled, all right. I guess you are, too. Maybe that's why you're happy and sort of beautiful. Maybe before long. You'll know why I'm all shined up today. Now, you wait here, Billy, until I call you. Okay, Mom. Wish me luck, darling. So very much depends on these next few minutes. All right. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Come in. You were a long time. Not long for a woman, John. Oh, Mary, it's good to hear your voice again. Is it? To think after searching all over the world for you. The doctor gives me a sleeping pill and I wake up and there you are, sitting beside me. Uh, this morning you told me you were not quite happy. Mary, darling, 
I haven't known a single happy hour. Not really happy since you left me. I believe you, John. John, I... I have a favor to ask you. You name it. I, uh... have a very talented pupil. Pupil? Yes. With a touch of your genius. I'd like you to hear him play. Oh, of course, of course, but... Well, let's not talk of pupils and prodigies. We have ourselves to talk about. What? He's downstairs right now. I'm Gladys McClellan, and I telephoned you for a reservation. Yes, Miss McClellan. You have Sweet Pea right across from Mr. Pirelli. Thank you. Well, I must, I must. But I warn you, I'm only doing it to humor you. And after that... Darling, I see you're not too badly hurt. Nothing serious? <laughs> That's the moment I got your call, and uh, evidently I arrived just in time. Gladys, this is Mary. How do you do, my dear? Antoine is so devastating, isn't he? And a past master in the old continental custom of kissing the hand. But you mustn't take him too seriously. I've suspected him of having a number of these little uh, excursions since we've met. But I'm going to marry the man in two weeks. So I think it's time you called a halt. And now, I'll take charge if you don't mind. I think I'll be much more soothing than a new and pretty face, won't I, darling? He's such a susceptible old pet. Wait, Mary. I think you deserve an explanation. Why, of course. But not now, darling. You're much too ill. And, and besides, I'm sure that uh, this lady and I understand each other perfectly. I'll call you later, Mary. Really, Antoine, I've always suspected I couldn't trust you out of my sight. But to flirt like this with a little country girl. That little country girl, as you call her, the woman I married in Paris 12 years ago. Darling, how very romantic. Did you uh, tumble out of the sky by metal telepathy to find her here? This is no matter for amusement. I see. But, Antoine. Pull yourself together. After all, you've become an important public figure, and, and for you to be thinking of a woman like that, why, why she'd hardly grace your dinner table. Listen, darling, I know how upsetting it must be, but, but you've got your career to think of, and I think I deserve some consideration. Please, Gladys, I know all that. I'm terribly sorry. Then, then for my sake, let's get on to Chicago. You'll probably feel differently in a day or two, and... And if you don't... Please, I'm much too confused. Later on, if you don't mind. Did it work? You mean he isn't going to give us an audition? No, dear. We're going home. Never mind, Mom. We'll save up our money and have that audition in New York. Yes, dear. Of course we will. You know, I'm not giving Antoine up without a rattling good fight. I'm getting the eight-ounce gloves out myself. Well, it's your next move. You won't talk to me. You leave it to me, my dear. I haven't handled him 12 years for nothing. I know all the angles. <laughs> you better pick a good one. Good morning, maestro. Gladys told me you were better. Yeah, I'm all right, Mickey. Excellent, excellent. Now we'll miss only one day of rehearsal. I phone for accommodations on the next train. Well, you can cancel them. What? I suppose Gladys also told you about Mary. Yes, yes. It must have been sort of a shock. Old memories and all that. But a lot of champagne has flowed under the bridge, maestro. And it's no good turning back. Besides, we're good businessmen. We can't jeopardize our contract. Can't you think of anything besides business and contract? Sure. But this is a chance of a lifetime. Two hundred thousand bucks. I don't care if it's two million bucks. I promised Mary I'd listen to one of her pupils play the violin. An audition? Well, I thought we settled that sort of thing years ago. Why, only this morning I chased 20 child prodigies out of the hotel lobby. Don't you understand, Mickey? This concerns Mary. I, I promised her. So, you promised to hear a kid play the fiddle. Well, what's that compared to your other obligations? What about me? What about Gladys? 
You promised to marry her. That, I think, is something that concerns Gladys and me. Most important of all is that I promised myself something. Twelve years ago in Paris. This, after all I've done for you. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mickey, don't start that again. Well, look what you are today. And look what you were when I found you in Paris. Plain John Pierce. A genius starving in an attic. Oh, cut it, will you please? No, I won't. I invented Antoine Pirelli. I put you over on the American public. I made you headline stuff all over the world, and this is the way you repay me. No good, Mickey. If you had anything but a money bag for a heart, you'd understand. Now, if you don't mind, uh, take the lair, will you? That's done it. This is the end. To think of the once great Michael J. Delancey playing second fiddle to a small town music teacher. Send up a double brandy, quick. Make it two. Make it two. I'd like to talk to Mrs. John Pierce. You got the number for me, please. Oh, there's no Mrs. John Pierce in the directory, sir. Really? But she lives here. She came here on my case last night. Oh, that was Mrs. Stanley, sir. Mrs. Stanley? Are you sure? Yes, sir. Uh, she nurses for Dr. Christie. Well, uh, get her for me, please. Yes, sir. Hello? Hello. Is this Mrs. Stanley's residence? Yes, sir. This is Mrs. Stanley's house. May I speak with her, please? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but my mother isn't here just now. Did you say your mother? Yes, sir. Mrs. Stanley is my mother, but she's gone out of town. Oh, I see. Thank you. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Billy. What are you doing around here? Did you forget that this is your day off? No. I just thought... Well, Mother went out of town for a few days. Out of town? Why? I don't know. We went to the hotel for an audition, and pretty soon Mother came down looking awful sick, and we went home. Didn't she give an explanation? No. She just cried like anything. You said she had to go away. Well, you'd better stay here, Petey, until she returns. Run along upstairs. Take the spare room. Thanks. It's all in the papers, Doctor. I can't understand it. If you'd seen him with Mary just now... Well, from what I hear... This Gladys McClellan usually gets what she wants. Operator, give me the hotel. I want to speak to Mr. Pirelli, please. I see. Thank you. You checked out. Is she called? Thought so. Well, I guess that finishes that. Good pancakes, Mrs. Hastings. There you are, Doctor. Another of your medical theories shot full of holes. Who says the human stomach only holds one quart? Well, when a fella gets a free meal, he ought to make the most of it. That's right, Billy. Yoo-hoo, Billy! Sounds like Nancy. Yeah. Better hurry. Women hate to be kept waiting. You bet they do. I know. You better prescribe for yourself this morning. You didn't eat a thing. There's no use, Doctor. In spite of all your knowledge and medical research, you'll never know why a woman acts the way she does when she's in love. And I don't know what Mary was thinking about. Thinking? Women don't think. They feel. They haven't got any brains. Just a few assorted emotions. And only about three of those. The strongest being to protect her young. Uh, that's number one. 
I suppose she thought it was the decent thing to do, to walk out like that. Decent? When is a woman ever decent when she wants to fight for a man? That's emotion number two. Not much fighting, Mary. When the other woman showed up in the scene... Other woman? <laughs> There's always another woman. That's when the fight really gets going. That's number three. Oh, no, Doctor. A man will never realize what makes the wheels go round in a woman until he's married to one and gets it beaten into his head with a rolling pin. Then he says uh, he's misunderstood. A boy like that has to write to know his own father. And a man like John Pierce has to write to know he has a son. Well, why don't you stop worrying and do something about it? You're Billy's godfather. So I am. How much money have I got in the bank? Oh, about $136. And we need it all for bills. It's not going to be used for bills. Well, what are you going to do? Gamble. For big stakes. Billy. Billy. Go home and put your Sunday suit on. We're going to Chicago. Chicago? Me too? No, dear, not this time. Maybe we'll bring you a present. What would you like? A new slingshot. Run home and pack a bag. Know how? Of course he doesn't. I'll have to do it for him. Come on, you. Northern Broadcasting Company. Operator. Just a moment, I'll see. Mary. One moment. But my daughter has the most marvelous voice. She can sing high C. High C, dear. <gasps> no, no, not here. Madam, I told you that auditions are Wednesdays and Fridays only, and never in the lobby. Very well. I shall take Irma to the Excelsior Broadcasting Company. I assure you, madam, that is our law. Auditions, Wednesdays and Fridays only. We are not here for an ordinary audition. We wish to speak to Mr. Pirelli. Uh, Senior Pirelli, rehearse the fifth floor. Thank you. Oh, you can't see him. No one is allowed in the rehearsal room except staff and sponsors. Oh, but this is urgent. We've come a long way. Sorry, sir, but we don't violate the rules for anyone. And a pass is required for all elevators. And the stairway doors are locked on all landings. The complete tour of the Northern Broadcasting Company for 40 cents. Get your tickets, folks. See how radio works for only 40 cents. See the world's greatest and newest phenomenon, television. I think you will be pleased with the orchestra, Signor Pirelli. We've spared no expense in assembling the best men. Have you any orders to give before we start the rehearsal? Oh, I beg your pardon. You'll have to speak louder, Mr. Simpson. Antoine is here only in the flesh today. His mind is far, far away. I asked if you had any orders, sir. Uh, no, none. This is the master control board. The sounds of any program emanating from this company are mixed in the monitor room of the studio, communicated to this board, and cleared here. The program travels from here by wire to the broadcasting tower, where it is released to the world. And this is the artist corridor, with dressing rooms on either side. Here, the great ones of radio and screen relax. Oh, if Clark Gable should come out, I'd just faint. Or Carol Lombard. Shirley Temple for my dough. It's a good thing Nancy isn't here. You better. She'd sock me in the eye. This way, please. Do we have to go now? Can't we wait till some of the stars come out? They rarely come out before sundown. <laughs> <laughs> May I present Mr. Mortimer Effington, who will give you a practical demonstration a few sound effects used in radio broadcasting. Ladies and gentlemen, most common among sound effects is the opening and closing of a door. Now, this is one effect that is utterly impossible to fake in any manner, shape, or form. Now, when you hear a door opening and closing on a radio program, you can rest assured it is a door. Door opening. Door closing. And now, the sound effect of soldiers marching. Now, you see, as the soldiers march, 
We have a little carousel of so they come in the sound effects to bring all the types of sand we spaded. Has it been? Formerly, we only had two rows of pegs, then we added one more row, you know, since conscription. Now we have the horse's hoofs. This is a kind of brace of baited. Now watch the capsule. That's the gallop of the horse when he created horses. Now the milkman early in the morning and brings in the milk to celebrate. Of course, they're afraid of your horses. You hear them. He says, open the window where you are, afraid of paint. And now the most difficult of all sound effects to achieve, the opening and closing of elevator doors. Oh, that's only a roller skate. <laughs> <laughs> what are the wild waves saying? Storm at sea. Now that effect is achieved by BB shots and a drum head. That's why we search all little boys and make them check their air rifles at the front door. <laughs> <laughs> you understand that all sounds are not created manually. You have to go and see the parts of the phonograph records and we just scale a play device. Now the uh, airplane zooming and zooming. <laughs> Must be something wrong with the category. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you want a battle scene, all you got to do is save the fodder and put it right in the case of the It's in the tape. It's all the device on the hold of needles and puts all the sound effects today to make so far into the night. And this little instrument, the champagne cork popping. <laughs> Why be a cheapskate? Let's throw a party. <laughs> now, have I made myself perfectly clear? Please. I'd like to know how you simulate the sound with Oh, of course. Sound. You see, as we take the little horse to spade and we go through the sound of the microphone, we don't have any little set of radius. We just came to Fort Rice, bring in the cat boss, and all the way through Sport. This cat <laughs> trace will find so that's to go through the whole reeks, and the sound effects coming back to the boss in the face. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we have a television broadcasting camera. In that room is the receiving set. Now, if you would just step in there, we will give you a practical demonstration. If someone, uh, young man, Yes. Would you like to go home and say that your voice and picture had been broadcast by television? Boy, that'd be keen. And step this way. Do your stuff, baby. Well, I don't know what to say, but I'm mighty glad to be here. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Well, I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard to see yourself in television, unless you could be in two places at once. Oh, I had to be twins, wouldn't I? <laughs> the announcer will merely say, Mr. McClellan of the famous McClellan products takes pleasure in presenting Senior Antoine Farrell in his office. Do you follow me, Mr. Perilli? I doubt it. Oh, yes, I follow. I'm, I'm sorry to be so abstracted today. Well, well, welcome home from River's End. <laughs> <laughs> Garden. I'm in luck to have you with me. A great privilege, senor. Toss your sidle, my dear fellow. It's a long time since we played together. Not since our fighting days. <laughs> That's right. All right, gentlemen. We'll uh, start with the letter B, second movement. On your left, we have Studio I, where rehearsals are now in progress for the McClellan Symphony Hour. Antoine Pirelli conducting. Here is a room for the relaxation of the personnel of the broadcasting company. Down this way, we have the publicity department. Where the stories of the stars are cut out. What are we playing, Doctor? Cops and robbers? Listen, Benny. For the next few minutes, you must do exactly as I say. And not ask any questions. Understand? Yes, sir. Let's try it again, gentlemen. This time, just a little lighter on the spiccato. All right? Better be. You know that, don't you? Sure. Take 
without your violin. to play that passage like that, my boy. My mother told me, sir. Your mother? Dr. Christian, who is this boy? Mary's favorite pupil. The one you were to listen to. What's your name, son? Louis Stanley, sir. That's what he's called in Riversand. But his real name is... William Pierce. William Pierce? You play well, my boy. Memories die hard, don't they, Antoine? What do you want me to do, Travis? There's only one thing for you to do. I'll do the rest. You know, I might be able and capable of coping with her. But a son, that's too much for me. So I'll bow out. You're being splendid about this. No. No, I'm not really, dear. I couldn't marry you and have those memories coming between us. Every time you took me in your arms, I'd know that you were thinking of her. Gee, Doctor, it's all kind of mixed up. No, oh, it's been a little mixed up for me, too, but it don't be straightened out now. Oh, I don't know. How do you talk to a guy when you've just found out he's your father? What'll I call him? I wouldn't worry about that. I'd just say, uh... Just whatever you feel. I know. I'll just say, how do you do, Father? No, that's too stiff and formal like. Hello, Daddy. No, that's sappy. Hiya, Dad. See, that sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good to me. Hello, son. Hiya, Pop. <laughs> Dr. Christian, uh, hadn't you better take Billy to my hotel and after lunch tomorrow, take him out to the ballpark to see the White Sox play. Would you like that, son? Boy, that'd be super. And say, maybe you better get a couple of suits of clothes. Dr. Christian will help you pick them out. And a dinner coat. Gee, you mean one of those with a hard-boiled shirt? Sure, if you're going to hang around this Mickey guy, you got to get used to a stuffed shirt. <laughs> But, Maestro, please, the rehearsal. Now, look, Mickey, I'm tired of being a puppet. You pull the strings long enough. From now on, I'm going to stand on my own hind legs and cast a shadow. I've got some unfinished business to attend to, but I'll be back in time for the broadcast, and that's all you need to know. How's that, son? That's telling him, Pop. Oh, uh, Dr. Christian, take good care of my boy. I always have. The McClellan Company presents tonight the first in a series of symphonic broadcasts <laughs> conducted by Antoine Pirelli. Our guest soloist is a boy violinist making his debut in radio, Antoine Pirelli, Jr. He will play the arrangement of the Brahms Hungarian dances made famous by his proud parents, 
Antoine Ferrelli, Sr. was a genius. And Johnny, tell your father I can make you a genius too. With a few extra lessons. 